Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window. Um, my Saturday stream, which is a stream of my friends, and I act, we actually have a traditional episode today. Oh, my God. Say hi, Landon. <laughs> I missed everybody so much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, this... we have it's like it's like a regular, it's a regular Landon stream. Oh my god. It's a regular, it's a regular stream. It's it this this is also very happy because it marks the very end of the chaos that has been my life over the course of the last two months. I have one more weekend in which is a bit chaotic, and then I'm like looking at my weekends going, holy shit, I might be here in my house alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes for the past like what six weeks you have either yeah. been gone or had visitors or had yeah. something that you had to do yeah every had single weekend <laughs> I, I i hosted family twice mm -hmm. uh for a week each by the way so that wasn't just the weekend it was a week each uh had a wedding mm -hmm. had uh had like through a party uh for a friend's birthday so lots of fun stuff went to taylor swift jesus christ how did oh that my break my my mind that was a week ago uh, i was in i was in chicago uh and got to breathe the same air as miss swift herself wow uh, <laughs> wow so nice so cool everyone uh, i know that's gone has said that the concert was just absolutely amazing it's it's phenomenal it, listen they ticketmaster sucks and ticketmaster should burn mm. the money to buy the tickets is worth it you the the tickets are ridiculously expensive a because of fees ticketmaster but also because of taylor swift tickets just being expensive mm. but it's one of those tickets where you're like man i understand why it was that much <laughs> because i don't think the concert part, the selling tickets part, I don't think she's making money off of it. I don't know how she could with how many backup dancers and fireworks and songs and this and that and that was there. I was like, yeah, it's all merch sales that she's she's actually making a profit I'm sure. on. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just don't see it considering that um, how the ticket price, the tick, what the ticket price was and then what people ended up paying scalpers for and like stuff like that. I just don't, I don't see it. But yeah, like, that's a nice thing sales. where you're like, oh, actually they put effort in you know it's not a scam where you have to pay a large amount of money and a right leg and your first child in order to attend this concert and then you're like man she strummed her guitar for an hour and a half that's not what happened <laughs> <laughs> and for that i'm very grateful yes for sure oh my gosh um well, well, Taylor Swift and weddings and all kinds of fun stuff aside, I do want to make sure that we let everybody know because this is a very hot topic right now and Landon and I are both on the East Coast. Neither of us are being affected by the smoke right now. We are we are all good. Luckily, we are both um, close enough to the ocean that we uh, and in the right spots where the wind is keeping it away at the moment. Yeah. Um, so so we we are we are smoke safe here. We can breathe outside. We're allowed. <laughs> it is it is really nice, but. That Definitely thoughts go out to those of you mm -hmm. how, who are not and are having to either stay inside or having to wear masks or just don't have access and are in, are, are in danger areas. Or we're definitely thinking about our people who are out there. And then Absolutely. also the people whose homes are being just destroyed yeah. by these fires. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's a lot of long term, short term, medium term, uh, every everything in between devastation going on right now. And um, and I'd be remiss if we talked about a book called Catching Fire and did not mention um, what's going on in the world right now. So please stay safe. You know, all of those masking things that we learned during COVID, they're applicable to smoke, too. So use all of those lessons. Um, that's yes. going to be really important to making sure that you do not, uh, you know, reap reap the uh, repercussions of the damages to your lungs that uh, could crop up many, 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 many years from now due yes. to all the smoke inhalation. So yeah, so that is what we're talking about today. So um, so Landon, tell us tell us just a little bit, uh, get us get us kind of started for this catching fire discussion. Look at this beautiful, look at this beautiful swamp PowerPoint. It's what the, the heck? Swamp, it's the swamp jungle PowerPoint here. We're in the Hunger Games. Um, catching Fire, second Hunger Games book. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. listen, I'm going to spoil it for you. This is a rave session. I don't think there's going to be an anti Hunger Games book discussion until maybe we haven't we haven't read the songs of Snakes and Ballads. So 
Yeah, we'll whatever. see how that goes. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But I can tell you with this one and probably the next one, it's just going to be a love town. Uh, and and especially for this one, because there's so much politicking involved in this book. Mm-hmm. There's something that Karen and I love. It is the deep dives into politics. Yes. Oh uh, <laughs> especially within <laughs> YA novels and frames. So uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, Miss, Miss Katniss Everdeen and the issues that she has with... Uh, the game that's really being played here, which is not the one in the arena. What? So what? before we kind of like, before we kind of get into it, before we even do favorite things, I just want to say, you know what's great about Catching Fire? Out of all of the fandom popular book series that I can think of, all of the YA popular series, all of the science fiction, fantasy popular series, dystopian popular series, this is one of the best second books yeah. like of a series like of any of those even the best series most popular series their second their second iteration whatever that is even if it's like a trilogy or like you know more than books usually the second is like the worst one either the worst fandom experience the worst written book the most the most to slog through but not not Hunger Games. This book is just as good, if not better in some ways, than the first. I I think it's very, very clear that Susie and Collins really knew exactly what every, every part of the series was going to be. She knew it was going to be a trilogy. She knew that each of the distinct parts meant something. And she had it, perhaps not all the way planned out, but she had a decent amount of it plotted and planned prior to even writing the first book Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yep because i think so many authors look at beginnings and endings and that second book especially in trilogies is the middle and so you're just like man this is this is the ladder get to get to a to z and we need to fit places where they can fit in order to get from a to z Mm -hmm. uh but for her she's like no this is a destination in itself and we need to take time for it yeah, I, I totally agree. There are parts of the series where you can tell like, oh, maybe this wasn't planned as well. I think a, a big criticism I have of this series overall in that regard is um, is Prim. I think that uh, Katniss and Prim's relationship, there should have been um, some changes in the first book that I could think could have solidified it because by the third book, that relationship com- becomes so important. It is very important in the first and second book as well. Just, I think that could have been set up a bit better, but like that's stagnant. a nitpick. That's a nitpick. It's stagnant, Yeah. It, yeah. Prim's character Prim, Prim's character doesn't experience growth until it's plot worthy to experience growth. Yeah. Uh and it's like, okay, it would have been nice for her to experience growth before that, but she doesn't. And it's fine. Yeah. But uh, so the thing is, is like with the hindsight, we get some of the best prim moments in the movies, which we're gonna have an episode about the movies, don't you guys worry. Um, but like that's but like there's little nitpicky things like that. But overall, you can tell like the main beats of Katniss and what she goes through, the main beats of the politics and what the series goes through. I do sense that there was either planning there or there was such a deep um, you know, knowledge of how these th- sorts of things play out, that even if there was no planning, like, you don't have this slog in the middle. It's just amazing. It, like, it's, if you're writing a series, okay, and you need to figure out how to do a good second book, Catching Fire, read Catching Fire and think about what makes it good, for real. It's yes, so good. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but before we continue this love fest, let's talk about our absolute, absolute favorite things. Okay. So Karen, how to choose one thing? What is it? Okay. It is Miss Everdeen, Mrs. Everdeen, um, Prim and Katniss's mom. Okay. I don't think this character gets enough love. And like the, the way that you see Katniss's mind change pre her going through the Hunger Games and then post going through the Hunger Games during the first two thirds of this book is really reflected in her thoughts about her mother and how she can suddenly sympathize with everything that her mother went through with um, marrying down a cast lower than herself. And then after she goes through that, she has kids, but then she ends up losing her husband and has to raise the kids on her own. And um, after going through the games, Katniss is able to kind of reframe her bitterness towards her mother into something that is just, it's beautiful, that she understands what her mother goes through and um, 
And she just kind of like sympathizes with her in a way that she couldn't before. And this is a character like this happens to me with a lot of characters in Hunger Games. But I would love to hear about the Hunger Games from Mrs. Everdeen's perspective. Um, And I do. And I say Mrs. Everdeen. I just want a small caveat here. I say Mrs. Everdeen. I know the actress gave her a first name. And I'm, I'm when I look at the fandom, there's like a name for her that I think the fandom chose or maybe the name is given in the Ballads of Songbirds and Steak. I don't I don't know. But canonically, within the first three books, we do not know Mrs. Everdeen's first name. So right now she is Mrs. Everdeen. I know that according to lots of different people, she has first names. I found three different ones on the Internet, but none of them are canonical in the trilogy. So, yeah, Mrs. Everdeen, that's my favorite. Mrs. Thing. Everdeen. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think um there's also it, it also possesses a great way of showing and not telling for the character of Katniss the yes. way that Mrs. Emmerdine because we see there is an experience where you when a person is growing up from uh childhood young adulthood adolescence to adulthood uh and it is that experience of realizing your parents aren't perfect and they're just as fucked up mm-hmm. as you are and so certainly there was a lot of issues with how Mrs. Everdeen coped with the death of her husband. Uh, But like Katniss never took into consideration her mother's trauma. It was something to be angry at her mother at. It was how it impacted Katniss. That was the forefront of it. Mm -hmm. In this book, we watch Katniss understand, oh shit, this is what, like, even though they're not the same, this level of heaviness has been weighing on my mom it makes her want to stop because I understand I want to stop. And if I could stop, I would. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's like a lot of forgiveness and a lot of understanding. And because of that, we see Katniss mature. We see her grow into an adult, like an an adolescent, older, young adult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's very clearly within the Because when you're a teenager, you're kind of going through this transformation, right, of going from childhood to adulthood. And it takes lots of steps to get there, of course. But we see, because of the character of Mrs. Everdeen, we see this gigantic leap between the first book and the second book of how Katniss is becoming less of a child and more of an adult. And I think that the way that Mrs. Everdeen's character is set up with everything that Landon said, like, yes, the way Mrs. Everdeen's character is set up just so perfectly exemplifies that in in a way that um, I think I didn't properly appreciate reading these books when they came out. I was too close to being a child at that time. Yes. And now that I am um, in, in, in my thirties, um, <laughs> what is it that Jenna Marl was used? 32 year old lady. I'm not 32. I'm a little older than that, but you get it. You get it. So I see that now and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like my heart goes out to Mrs. Everdeen. And I love the way that Katniss speaks about her in this second book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, and I think I didn't even know what Garen had chose. I think that's an awesome choice. Like, I think <laughs> it's one of the characters that people don't think about at all. Yeah, I didn't reveal um, it. I didn't, I was, when we were talking, I was like, I don't know, Landon, I have to think about it. And then as I was putting everything together, I was like, oh, I know who I want to talk about. I know who I want to mention. And I think Landon's going to have good thoughts on this character too. <laughs> so yeah, that's my oh, favorite thing from this book. Um, Landon, what is your favorite thing? Oh, we gotta talk about that dress. Mm. <laughs> oh my uh, god. Jesus. Uh, the whole situation. It'll be in the summary, but basically uh, as part of the interviews, uh, Snow, President Snow, makes Katniss wear the wedding dress that she was supposed to marry Peta in uh, at the final interviews prior to going on to the games. And it is this beautiful, resplendent, capital-worthy dress for Capital's golden girl. Uh, but then fucking Cinna, the masterpiece Cinna that he is, uh, turns it into a sign of rebellion. Mm-hmm. He is able to give it the, the sparks and the fire that happened so much in the previous costumes from the last Hunger Games. And it catches a fire and is turned into this beautiful symbol of the Mockingjay. Uh, and it is, it is, it is representative of, of, of Katniss sitting there and going, fuck you, but being used as a prop to say fuck you, because she doesn't ever do it directly. And it's also Sinna's way of burning down his reputation to sit there and say, I am in support of the rebellion. Oh my God. Uh, 
and and that like direct rebellion from an insider is like such a is like such a political move that we hadn't seen yet in this series but like existed it was awesome perfect so, uh, so that you know, that wedding dress <laughs> you know how Cinna was like a favorite thing of mine last book basically Landon was like okay Cinna's my favorite thing this time <laughs> <laughs> yes I mean, yeah I, I loved him last time too but this this move Mm-hmm. And what it represents for both the character, his character, and the rebellion overall uh, is amazing. Yep. So I don't want to say too much about the rebellion part because we're going to get yes. to that at the end of um, of our talk for today. But I just want to say, like, the way that this is portrayed in the books and in the movies is like so magical. Just the way it's described that she spins around and then she has the wings and then, you know, Caesar's like, it's a bird. And she's like, it's a mocking jay, right? And then, um, and it's just too much, right? In the capital that just has to like shut it off. So I want to put a well, pin in that thought because I want to yes. definitely talk more about that when we talk about the, re- the rebellion at the end. Yes, but, but yes, good. Moment. But also it's a fucking gorgeous dress. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I was like, that was one of the things that I, that I've always loved and appreciated about the movies, but also about the world itself. Uh, In dystopian novels, there's, because it is a post-apocalyptic life, there's so little attention spent on the details of like rich and having much money and fashion because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously we'll we'll talk about this as well as as we talk discuss the capital more in depth. But like I love that Suzanne Collins pays attention to the fashion mm-hmm. of the world as well. Mm-hmm. Um and that it's subtle enough that it's like obviously not like all about fashion, but it's there in the world building. It's a subtle world building. Yes. It's really and I good. appreciate that too. Yes, for sure, yes. for sure. I told I love it. I it's 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 amazing. <laughs> it, amazing all right shall we get into it yes okay so how we like to start off of course is um we know it might have been a while since you've read these books so if it's been a while for you we are going to summarize the plot of catching fire so that you are all caught up and can remember everything you need to remember for this discussion so landon take it away so the hunger games have passed and katniss and peter are rich now yay (laughs) <laughs> out here living her life Katniss comes home from the woods to find President Snow waiting for her in her living room he's concerned that any more public defiance by the Capitol uh, could spark an uprising of the districts and he makes a subtle suggestion that she and Peter continue to act as if they are in love or the Capitol will hurt Gail Katniss tells Hamish everything, which we learned is a big tri- trigger because <laughs> Hamish's whole family was murdered by the Capitol, uh, and then realizes that she'll never be able to stop playing this Capitol's game. Problem is that Peta and Katniss have had a tense relationship because Peta found out that Katniss was only pretending to be in love during the Hunger Games while he was actually in love during the Hunger Games. They agree to be friends, however, as they embark on the victory tour to the districts. They stop at District 11, where Rue's family is from. But during the speech, an old man in the crowd whistles the signal that Katniss and Rue had come up with together. And everyone in the crowd puts a gesture of respect of Katniss's home district for District 12 in the air. And before she is rushed away, Katniss sees a group of peacekeepers execute the old man. As the tour continues, Katniss senses an undercurrent of repressed rage that suggests that the people are ready to rebel everywhere. At the end of the tour, as a way to quell the angry crowd, Peter proposes during a televised interview to appease the Capitol, that President Snow indicates to Katniss that that is not enough. Later at a feast, the President Snow mansion, Katniss is, meets and is introduced to Pol- Poltark Heavensby, who is the new head game maker. He shows her his watch, and when he rubs his face, the mocking, uh, mocking jay, like the one that she, uh, the one on the pin that she wears quickly uh, appears and then quickly vanishes. After she's home, she learns that there has been an uprising in District 8. Katniss goes to meet Gail in the woods and tells them everything that happened. She wants to run away with their families and Gail tells her that he loves her. When she mentions the uprising, however, he says that he wants to stay and fight. Katniss goes to tell Peta, who agrees to run away. 
But then in the town's main, main square, they find K Gail being publicly whipped for hunting. As Gail recuperates, Katniss realizes that she loves him and decides not to run away. Oosh. <laughs> Weeks later, Katniss goes back into the woods and is shocked to meet two women. One holds out a cracker to Katniss with an image of her mocking Jay in the center. They explain that they're from District 8 and have fled through the uprising and they're on their way to District 13, which was destroyed years earlier, but which people believe is a group for underground rebels. Back home, Katniss watches a televised announcement of the Quarter Quell, where every 25 years, a special Hunger Games occurs. And this year is the 75th anniversary of the Hunger Games. And in the announcement, President Snow says some tributes will be selected from among the past winners of the game. Since Katniss is the only female winner of District 12, it means that she'll be going back to the arena, no matter what. Katniss, Peta, and Haymitch began training for the games, and when the reaping or tribute selection happens, Peta volunteers to go in Haymitch's place. They meet the other tributes, most of whom have, they have known each other for years, uh, which makes the games so much worse, given that they're all going to have to kill each other eventually. Katniss immediately dislikes a young, hot man named Finnick O'Dear, uh, and also Joanna Manson, who is a woman from District 7. She likes the oddballs, Wyrus and Beatty, uh, who are both smart but physically weak. And she likes Max, an oldie, an 80-year-old woman from District 4. <laughs> the tributes are interviewed on television before they depart the arena. And President Snow makes Katniss wear her wedding dress. Cinna, Katniss Silas, rigs it up. And during the interview, it burns away, leaving Katniss with a Mockingjay costume. Finally, the tributes are sent to the arena, which appears to be a small tropical island, and the games begin. Right away, Katniss comes face to face with Finnick, and to her surprise, turns out they're allies. <laughs> and she notices the bracelet on his wrist that had belonged to Hamish. Katniss, Peta, Finnick, and Mags form a group and head into the jungle where Katniss discovers that they're an electric force field that creates a dome over them. Suddenly, a fog descends around them, turning to be a toxic nerve agent. They run from it, and Finnick can only carry Peta and Mags because Peta had been hurt previously. So Mags sacrifices herself running into the fog. The remaining three barely make it to the beach, but eventually meet Joanna with Ryers and Beatty. Joanna tells Katniss that she saved them for her. And Katniss realizes that the island is laid out like a clock face, with each selection containing a different attack triggered at a set time. Uh, she remembers that Poltark had been talking to her with his watch that had showed the symbol of the Mockingjay. She realizes that he was trying to help her. They head off to the Cornucopia, which is where all the weapons are, uh, but, are but a gr group of tributes sneak up on them. One slits Virus's throat, Katniss kills him, and Finnick saves Peta once again during the fight. The group heads back to the jungle, and when Peta wants to collect water, Joanna won't let him. Katniss realizes the other tributes are trying to keep Peta alive, but she doesn't know why. Just then, Katniss hears with a sound like her sister screaming. Turns out that they're jabber jays, and they are of voices of their tortured loved ones mimic mimicked over and over again. Finnick hears it as well, and they spend the next hour going a little crazy. Uh, that night, Peta tells Katniss that she has to survive for the sake of her family and that he doesn't have anyone who wants to see him alive. Uh, Katniss disagrees and they end up holding each other and kissing. The next morning, Beatty has a plan. They're at noon. Each day, the lightning tree is, and midnight, the lightning tree on an island is struck. What they're going to do is wrap wire around the tree, take it back to the ocean and electrocute the large area around the water and whatever sand is wet. He thinks that he will kill most of the tributes this way. Uh, they hike to the tree, wrap the wire around it, and Katniss and Joanna began carrying it back, but suddenly the wire is cut. And before Katniss knows what's happening, Joanna hits her in the head and cuts something out of her arm. Katniss, still dizzy, is trying, is, thinks that they're trying to kill her and Peta, heads back to the tree where she sees Peta, Peta sorry, Petey with the same arm wound holding a knife uh, with the wire wrapped around it and realizes what he's trying to do. She wraps the wire around one of her arrows, flies it through a small visible gap in the field, and when the lightning strikes, it breaks forth the dome. Uh, 
She wakes later to find herself in a hovercraft, and on board is Hamek, Finnick, and Plutarch, and they are, have to explain everything. Plutarch has been for years a part of the secret rebel group of, in the capital, wanting to destroy the wanting to destroy Snow and take down the capital. What they cut out of her arm was a tracking device, and several of the districts are now in full scale results, and they're headed towards District Thirteen. And lastly, they tell Katniss the only reason they kept Peta alive was because she knew that they wouldn't help. She wouldn't help if he had died, but they had left him behind because he wasn't needed anymore. They were taken to the capital. Katniss, in a rage, attacks Hamish, feeling he used her and Peta. She is sedated, and they head to they head to Dash District Thirteen with the news that District Twelve has been utterly destroyed. <sighs> Don't. Even just hearing a summary, it makes me tear up. Like this book is so good. It's and so, so good. much. This is one of the things that I know that we talked about in our review is like so much happens in it, but every single thing is a necessary and b. It's still under three hundred and some pages long. Mm-hmm. Like it's under four hundred pages. Mm-hmm. So it is fast paced, pretty easy to read, and interesting and engaging. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a kid, I remember as a kid thinking like, when are they going to get to the games? The games part is only the last third of the book, which if you watch the movies afterwards, which you you would have, like you probably don't remember that. But despite that, it's still very fast paced. And like, okay, so if we think about the plot of this book compared to the first one, this is another thing where I'm like, you know, what's great about Catching Fire. Suzanne Collins was like, everyone loved making kids kill each other in the first book. Let's do that again. Same plot. Okay, we'll just tweak a few things. And she was right. She was right. Like, it's exciting. It makes you want to pick up the second book. And um, yeah. and it makes you want to get to that part and, and, and finish the first two parts, even if you don't fully understand the politics of what's going on and aren't as engaged in those first two parts. And I think instead of also like it, it being like, oh, everyone likes kids killing each other. She was like, we're going to one up it and we're going to have that these sh- people who s- these adults who survived killing their peers have become friends over the course of, with all these people. We're going to kill. We're going to make those people kill each other. Right. Like it. it is so completely just it, it, it. There's so many Rome vibes. And I know that we're going to talk about that later, but like the Colosseum of it all of just being like oh you thought you were safe no this is for our entertainment bitch is very strong in this yes yes <laughs> and we are going to talk about a lot of those adult characters but before we do we have one character that we really wanted to talk really deeply about um yes. and that is mr pita malark um this is an another character where i'm just like Wow, I would love to read these books from Peter's perspective. Like, can we get can we get like a rewrite from Peter's perspective? Like, I think I that would be so amazing. <laughs> I didn't need I didn't need Twilight from Edward's perspective. I need it from Peter's perspective. Right? <laughs> right? Like, okay. I I need I need Hunger Games from Peter's perspective because I think it is a completely different book. Uh-huh. It's uh-huh. it, this is I mean I I've named it this is a story about a boy named Peta. Peta knows that he is the side character in his own story, mm-hmm. uh, which is such an interesting take to have on a a love interest and b also having a character be so utterly aware that they are not the main character of the story, right? Uh, because you don't often see that. No, you don't. And he's so right. Like when they when they are doing their tour and he just goes off on Katniss and Hamish, like he is so right for that. Like his anger yes. is so real and so justified. And Katniss and Hamish deserved like even more cruelty from him than what he gave. Like that what they did to him, the way they treated him, the way they pushed him off to the sidelines is cruel. They removed his agency in a situation that was just as deadly to him as it was to the two of them. Mm -hmm. And um, him demanding that they cut that shit out is like so real and like, and they deserved it. They deserve to be spoken to like that in that situation. Well, and it's also so juxtaposed, just juxtaposed, wow, found it, but didn't, Uh, was later when he's talking to Katniss and basically is like, I'm not the person who needs to be alive. You need to be alive. You have family. You have friends. You have people outside of this. 
And it, and we saw that a little bit in the first games where he was like, no one thinks I'm going to win. No one is rooting for me. No one thinks I can do this. But this is like a resound sort of way of this, of being like, no, I am here because you need to win. I am here because I don't matter in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, that mm-hmm. even though I get a choice in it, and that's what kind of like what the first part was him asking for it. He's like, I also know that at the end of the day, Katniss, you're the you're the one. Mm-hmm. But the reason Peta goes in instead of Haymitch is because that's what gives Katniss the best chance to win is being with him, not being with Haymitch. And yes. Peta yes. knows this, and so that's why he chooses it. He doesn't choose to go in because he's like, ah, oh, no one cares about me if I die. It's whatever. My life is meaningless. He chooses it because he knows that that gives Katniss the best chance to win. Well, I also think that Hamish has wa- is watching it from rebellion eyes. Yeah, like I think that even even we don't know how much Hamish has been like integrated into the rebellion for a long. I mean, we know he I, has, I, I but we, we don't know, know that what he has. Degree. But I also am like, he was drunk for most <laughs> of his life. Mm-hmm. I I don't think a lot of people who are like planning the heavy duty rebellion are like trusting him with a lot of information until he had a use and his use right <laughs> like Hamish probably like gets invited to the pro- Hamish probably gets invited to the zoom calls but when he doesn't show up they just start talking anyway <laughs> start you know it's fine <laughs> yeah and and it's also like or he doesn't even get invited to the, su- the zoom calls he's that one person that like they're like hey Finnick, fill in Hamish <laughs> on this like just just <laughs> let him know ish <laughs> uh but I I think that um Hamish Hamish was looking at it from a point of we need to keep Katniss alive for the rebellion Mm -hmm. but the reality is is that what makes Katniss the perfect symbol is how humanized she is Mm -hmm. through the games how human and honest that she doesn't play the capital games that she comes in human that she can relate that people can relate to her from all the districts including the capital and PETA brings out the humanity in her Mm-hmm. Peter is the person who makes her worried. Peter is Peter is the person who, when he gets hurt, she's upset. When she's like just been tortured by hearing Prim, uh, Prim's cries for help after the Jabber Jays, he's the one who like talks to her and holds her. He's the one who like ki- kisses and holds her all night and have and has these moments that really humanize her, that remind the people who are on the fence of the rebellion on the outside why they should be fighting Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and let's not forget it's pita's words that make the audience in the capital start to think that like they should cancel the hunger games actually and they become a part of the rebellion because of what pita says because Mm -hmm. pita's like oh she's pregnant now we all know it's a lie obviously right but Peter's not trying to convince us or the districts. He's trying to convince the capital who thinks that no. he's just this genuine sweet boy that don't really realize how intelligent he is. And so like it's him because if he hadn't done that, then the audience wouldn't have had the reaction that they had. Katniss and Peter wouldn't have started holding hands, which made everyone start holding hands. Like it just none of this would have happened. Well, and it's... so like Peter really is like the brains of this outfit. So there's also an interesting take on a trope here that we have no way of knowing if it was purposeful or not, but something that just truly makes me love the series even more is that there is a trope within YA romance, fantasy romance, dystopian romance, where it is the idea that the the woman is not worth anything until a man sees her. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so PETA being the person who uplifts Katniss through the eyes of the capital and that storyline while also recognizing that he needs to take a back seat during all of it, that he that his purpose is to uplift, is to see her, but not to have the story revolve around him and her, is an interesting like circumventing of that trope, or even a commentary on that trope, that made me like love the story without realizing why it was I loved the story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what, Peta? Peta would make a really good Ken. I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> Peter is Ken. Peter is Ken. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. that's the thing. Gail could never be Ken. No. Peter, best kid. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Gail could never. And, and that. Gail could never. No, because Gail would not have understood 
like the way to actually save Katniss, the way that PETA does, because everyone has to get together and choose who the winner is. Like they know they're not all making it out of the arena. Like they have this escape plan of like that will disrupt the dome, but they have no clue that it's going to work until Katniss makes it work, right? Like nobody no. knows. And so, you know, they they ultimately choose Katniss and and PETA is the person that's in there with her because he knows how to make sure that if no one else makes it out, at least she makes it out. Well, and also in that same vein, they also know that they have, like they, they say it. The only reason we kept Peter alive, the only reason Joanna saved him, the only reason that Finnick wasted time resuscitating him was because they knew that without him, Katniss would not cooperate. Yeah. Katniss would not play the game. Uh, and so, like, it was, like, this thing of being, like, okay, Katniss is going to be the winner, but we also have to keep Peter al- alive as, as long as possible. And PETA never had an issue with that. Mm-hmm. He knew his role. He played it perfectly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, they knew that the whole goal was to get it down to just PETA and Katniss, just like the first games. There was, n- mm-hmm. there was nothing There was nothing else. Like They had to get down to three people where it was PETA, Katniss, and the other person, and then it would be time for PETA to die. And then Katniss, of course, would could be the winner because they could whoever that was could just sacrifice or, themselves. That's the original plan. Yes, or, or, or I think there was a mention of like them killing like very similar situation of it's them the final two they have to turn to against each other and yeah. don't turn against each other and then the entire nation has to watch the capital slaughter both of them yeah because they refuse to slaughter each other yeah and that in itself like either way either one of those sparks more rebellion mm-hmm 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 and we get these like really lovely glimpses through the tours that Peta and Katniss do about about all of that and Peta just always handles it perfectly like Mm -hmm. and that's the way that he is portrayed uh throughout this whole book and I just think like I just think about this like the actual reality of reading the book versus the marketing of what happens with Peta, Kale, and Katniss and like in the first book like they're teenagers and Katniss really does not have much of a sexuality at all in the first book and so it's like where is the love triangle there basically isn't one but in this book we finally do get Katniss actually having some kinds of romantic thoughts and feelings about both Gail and Peta like we have the scene where Gail is whipped and um and she she realizes that she really might be about to lose him and so there's this kind of sort of love confession but it's really it's really more of like the tragedy of potentially losing him and then you know she kind of has some realizations in the arena about what it's going to mean at the end and that she's probably going to lose Peta as well and so then she starts having these romantic feelings about Peta but her romantic feelings really only come about in the face of supreme and dire loss so we still oh my gosh hello Lunar hello how's it going (laughs) um so we have this question of like okay so who does Katniss even love and I think in this book the answer is still survival (laughs) survival but I, I, I think that there is a key difference, too. And I think that this is, like, the human psychology of it. She's a character, so how much of this is, like, planned out? Who knows? But, like, right, right. there is this idea of that she left. Her her father died in a tragic accident with no warning. Mm-hmm. And he went to work and didn't come home. And that same scene sort of plays out with Gail is that she leaves him he goes he goes to do the thing that he has been doing every day since he since they were 15 going out and hunting and there is this expectation that even though she and peter are planning on leaving that he is going to come back and she watches as he as his life is put on at risk that he doesn't come back and like i believe that it stirred those feelings of being like holy shit i'm gonna lose this man just like i lost my dad and that added to the emotionality. Whereas with PETA, it is those moments of understanding. It is those moments of human connection. It is those uh, of trauma. We have survived a trauma together. And you are the only person who understands what I have gone through. 
versus like, oh my gosh, this is my blanket and it's about to be taken away. Right. Because when they are discussing whether they are going to run away or not run away, PETA knows what to say to actually relate to her and help her. Whereas Gail just makes her upset and confused. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what happens. Gail doesn't get it. Like Mm-mm. she, we, it's actually really funny because very rarely do we have in a love triangle to the character, the main female character having the same conversation with two men uh, that she's interested in. And we literally see it back to back. <laughs> and it is like this, we are like, oh, holy shit, we have direct comparison. How would Gail react to this? How would Peter react to this? Peter reacted correctly for for her. Uh, Gail reacted correctly for who she used to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a big difference. So this concept of who does Katniss love, yeah, survival. But I also think on a on a note of who the f- like Gail couldn't have gotten her through this. I don't think if Gail had gone into the Hunger Games in this game it, it it wouldn't have been able to do the same things that Peter did for her or Peter Peter did for her mm-hmm. uh and that like I'm like it's obviously Peta in my mind survival first Peta second Gail is like down the line somewhere <laughs> yeah I don't see how someone can finish this book and think that the the best ending it truly is Katniss and Gail I feel like like shipping Katniss and Gail together it has to come from like you think the actors are hot or it's some kind of fandom experience I, or something. I just don't see how you could think that that's a canon thing. I get it after the third movie mm-hmm. because I think Gail goes through the same shit as Katniss does and starts to understand Katniss. Yep, and starts to understand the whole the the trauma of it all uh but i think any time before that is literally i'm scared to be losing i am scared to be outgrowing this thing that i that used to be everything yes yes and that would be scary so um so spoilers for for when we do the final hunger games book um, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about Gale because in yes. the third book, uh, he actually is a real character for the first time <laughs> and he does things. It, her, her ADHD of, of object in, uh, permanence doesn't take uh, precedent <laughs> as much in that because he's around so much more. Uh, right? She doesn't have time to forget he doesn't exist. No, right? we, will, we will talk about Gale a lot in that one. We'll talk about all of them a lot in that one. But I think um, I think Peter really shines in this one yes and we yes. see we see how the games have effect on him and how that's so different yet so similar to Katniss's mm-hmm. um that he 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 he's kind of been like I have no more blanket to hold on to Mm-hmm. So I get why you're holding on to yours, but it's okay to let it go sort of thing. And I mean, he's right. If if we take everything that we know about his parents, like it, PETA himself doesn't yeah. matter. Like they could make another one. It's really not. It's really not the same. It's not the same. I mean, I'm sure his parents like no, love him I, in their way, but it's not the same. But like, let's just in case you forgot PETA's parents, his father is very uh, absentee-ish. As mm-hmm. much as you can be in a small society here, d- checked out, completely checked out. Emotionally, mom, he's not there. <laughs> his mom is a raging abusive asshole yeah. uh, who is physically, verbally, and emotionally abusive to him. Uh, and he is their free child labor. Like he is, he, he, they are from the richer part of town. It's not, it's just the working it's class. It's like part the of artesian town. class. Like they're like, they're the, they're the quote unquote yeah. middle class, but they're still working class just like everyone else. They just don't go they're, in the mines. Yeah. They just don't go in the mines, but it is like they run a a cake shop and he is the person who can do the things to make sure that it continues to run in a right way. And anything that is fucked up is his fault. And he is abused on all levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like him being like, yeah, they, they don't care. They can make another kid. They can have another baby. They can do the same thing to me. Yeah. He, he gets that. (laughs) So tell us, so tell us down below if you are Team Katniss and Gale, 
Um, if you're watching this on YouTube Why? in the in the comments, please justify yourself. I would love to hear your reasonings. Enlighten me and bring me to your side. <laughs> or Lunar, if you're still hanging I, out, I would love to know if you prefer P Peta or Gail. I think that there's something really romantic about the the lovers to or the friends to lovers sort of trope. So I get that. This is just not that story. Yeah. It's like if, if you're you're dying for the trope that doesn't exist here that that you are making up in your head if you want to fan fiction it that's fine but that's not the game well that's what i assume it has to be and i have some ships like that i can understand oh well yeah <laughs> for absolutely sure. for sure all right well, yeah that's Peta. i clicked the thing too quickly but that's okay Ad break. It's ad break time. Ad break. So as you guys um, know, all of these episodes are sponsored by Audible. Oh. Um, Audible is how I am even reading the Hunger Games books. And I do absolutely recommend the audiobook version. Team PETA, I knew you would be, girl. I knew you would be. Um, so Audible is how I'm actually reading these Hunger Games books. Uh, they are narrated on Audible by the ineffable, the amazing Miss She-Hulk herself, Tatiana Masonly, and she does an amazing job. You can imagine her portrayal of Katniss in particular through her narration is just beautiful. Like I could see, I could see a, a world where where Tatiana Masonly played Katniss um, instead of uh, of Jen Jennifer Lawrence. No shade to Jennifer Lawrence's portrayal. I do love it. We'll talk about that when we talk about the movies. But yeah. Um, so it's wonderful. So Landon, do you have an, an audible recommendation for us today? I do. I have just started listening to this on audible. Uh, and I'm the thing that I'm a little bit excited about is that I might be switching jobs. And that means that I'll be able to listen to audible more often because I'll have a longer commute. And I'm very excited. Oh, excited but... for a longer commute. That's quite the shout out for audible. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, this is legend born. Which is a uh, by Tracy Dion, which is uh, a YA novel uh, that is the new series that is happening right now. And it is winning a, a shit ton of awards because it is phenomenal. Uh, she's a debut author. She, she hasn't written anything else. And um, it's uh, a uh, about a character of color who uh, she has magical powers and is just taken down the, the government and it's I I just started it but I've heard great things the audiobook is done really well and really clean uh I 100% recommend it and would let's ha encourage anybody else who is looking for a new YA series to dig your teeth into uh to listen to this one oh uh oh oh sorry going backwards in time I, there we I go. touched I touched the thing. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's quite the recommendation. But... You know, I actually had an ad for that. Um, it wasn't really an ad. It was someone just like recommending it or whatever pop up on my Twitter timeline. So um, yes. so it seems like it has a lot of fandom potential as well. Very much so. It's it's basically a modern day twist on the author, uh, like the uh, like uh, Knights of the Round Table legends. Mm hmm. Okay, so it's very like knights going out on on missions, kind of yes, sort of set, story set in contemporary. So it's like an urban fantasy uh, retelling of Arthurian legends. Oh, I with, see. With with characters like, but also like talks about the diversity of our current world as well as uh, some LGBTQ representation. It is it is kind of all the perfect mix of like twenty twenty three what what we want it to be for writing mm -mm. well you know i mean we couldn't uh you know do our audible audible recommendation we couldn't have a straight one for pride month like that no. would just be that illegal would... so i'm um, sorry so i know it's so obviously this is a gay book <laughs> uh, yes I, uh, they should all be gay <laughs> <laughs> Landon, I have heard your kitty cat meow no less than three times this so this many. stream. So <laughs> many times. He's right behind me too. But oh the problem is, is that is that I put my hand down and he then just starts licking me with his sandpaper tongue. Uh and Lovely. then if I go to pull it away, it is like both arms come to like grab me and I'm just like, I can't give you attention. <laughs> <laughs> maybe just pull him up in the lap like see if he'll see if he'll do some lap sit i don't know it? if he will i'm not sure no we'll no? see he might he might make appearance 
He wants he, he wants you to get on the ground with him, not the other way around, right? That's not might, good enough. He, he might not be allowed. He's usually not allowed on my desk, but I'm just like, you are going insane. Yeah, Hi. poor kitty cat. <gasps> Hello. Oh my gosh, we could almost see. We could almost see. We'll see if I can get him up here. <laughs> He's trying so yes. hard. I understand. Yeah, I try not so to let the cats on my desk too much either because then they walk on keyboards and break things, you know? Yes. He he does do that. Hi. Yes. It's Hello. Sherlock. I don't well, we saw a little I, paw. I tried. We'll see. We'll see. He'll I have a space here that I cleaned off for him. So if he comes well, up, it's sure it's sure. Sherlock. So if, if a kitty cat pops up, now you guys know it's Sherlock who is who is saying hello. He's basically a panther. He's my 18 pound black cat that is oh just my huge. gosh that's how oreo is only i mean he's not all black he's black and white but he's like a zillion Last time pounds. I saw oreo he was so tiny yeah he's gigantic now <laughs> they apparently do that did you know they grow up and oh i my hate god it. yeah but he grew up a lot <laughs> anyways he grew up, a, he grew up a lot all right anyways there i would say i would say that there are no cats in hunger games but there are actually there's one cat it's just not a very important character unfortunately i do appreciate the cat represent excuse me, the cat representation in this post-apocalyptic world, because there's also mention of a couple stray dogs in the area, mm -hmm, but like mm -hmm. no one's owning a dog. Yeah. There are pet cats though. And I'm just like, man, there would be though. There would that's be. That's how it'd be. <laughs> yeah. That's how it would be in the apocalypse. You'd have pet cats for sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Deep dive on some characters. Yes. Okay. So part two, you guys, we're going to talk about the victors. So we talked about this just very briefly after the plot summary, but you know, what's, what's really great about catching fire, the adult characters. Oh my God. It's not all teenagers this time. Ah, I love it. I love it's it. So, but they There's all have... people. Okay. So here's my thing though, is that they are all <laughs> very teenage like because they were <laughs> all teenagers when their trauma happened and yes. then none of them healed. All of them just badly self-destructively co coped. Yes. And due to that, uh, they just uh, act like a bunch of teenagers and are very clicky about it. And now they have to kill each other. So there are adults acting like teenagers with years of relationships built having to kill each other. Yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> I I love it. I just I, I think I think just this whole concept of the way that they did the quarter quell to bring in these characters is just beautiful. So we're going to do just a little bit of a um of some conversation basically about um Katniss's allies, okay? So we're not going to go through every single victor because most of them get like barely a mention, but uh but we do want to talk a little bit about the ones that we actually spend some time with in this mm -hmm. book because there's some very interesting things going on there. Um, so we're going to start that with our favorite sexy man of the book, Finnick. Okay. Gail don't even know. Okay. Gail don't even know. You guys thought Gail was the sexy man of the Hunger Games? Wrong. It's Finnick. We just didn't meet him yet. Yeah. We just didn't know. Uh, I do love that straight off the bat, uh, Katniss knows who this is. Because it's just like, yeah, everybody fucking knows who Finnick is. Yeah. <laughs> He's... Finnick O'Dare. Uh, the thing about Finnick O'Dare is that he was the youngest victor ever, I do believe. Yes. Uh, I think he came in at 14. Yes. Uh, and murdered the shit out of everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he trident. was, yes, he was a, he is not a career. He, he was a district four. So he wasn't a richer, he was in the fishing bill. He was in the fishing part. Yeah. And of the, remember district of four, some district four tributes sometimes join the career pack, but not always. They they are not yes so the well the the things that make careers careers is that they are like they go to school for it yes so they are uh, district four is often allied with the career pack but there isn't like a school in district four unlike yeah. district one two and three they don't train them up uh, like that yes, exactly but obviously being a son of a fisherman and was fishing himself uh was very fit when going into the Hunger Games. Yep. And he, he was he was a ripped 14 year old. Ripped. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And um he basically uh used like nets to catch catch his people and all that kind of stuff. Uh and then he uh was forced into prostitution by mm -hmm. President Snow. I think uh, it because is... go, go ahead. ahead. No, finish your thought. I was I was gonna say because uh everybody thought he was so attractive and um winners become 
become prizes for people that at young 15, uh, Finnick was basically threatened with the death of his family and the people that he loved, uh, that if he didn't do what Snow said, that he was going, they were going to all die. Uh, <laughs> and it was, I think, it's interesting because YA always skirts a line and things like this are often in YA, but so subtly that it's like, oh, I didn't realize what was happening when I read this when I was 14 years old, <laughs> but I do now. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm, I'm older enough than, than you that I did. I did fully yes. understand what the heck they were putting Finnick through um, at this time. And I just think that it's quite interesting that the choice that Suzanne Collins made was to say, oh, the youngest victor ever is also the one that everyone considers the hottest and one of the victors that was forced into prostitution. Like, what does well, that say? Like, let's okay. think about that. What does that say? And we do. We fetishize the high school age. For In this country, we believe that, like, high school is the time. And... um. Typically, of course, in our media, we will cast adult characters or adult actors to play high school characters. But this is a book. OK, there's no actors or anything in a book. And uh, and so she's basically saying that, like, you know, we love them teens. We love them teens. And Finnick had absolutely no struggles becoming a prostitute. It was a very easy job for him. He made lots of money and got lots of people's secrets and gained lots of power from it. So it was, he was incredibly desired, not just aesthetically, but literally and physically and frequently. Okay. He was not put up on a pedestal for them to gaze at. They literally like let him into their bedrooms. Yes. Uh, 14. And, and he also, but he also like learned the trade of secrets afterwards, mm -hmm. which was that being like, I have all the money in the world and being told that I have to do this thing. I'm going to continue to do it because I can learn things about the people of this world and I can gain power in that way. Um, I also wanted to just like go in on the interesting fact of that the per that the person that we know was forced into prostitution is also not only a t was not only a fourteen year old but was a fourteen year old boy, uh, that, and that that was very popular among others, specifically men, in the capital. And I think that there is an interesting uh, comment in there too because not only are we obsessed with fourteen year olds but also like that that idea of the people in power. Typically, a lot of men would have power, will, will sexually abuse young young boys in particular uh, for that extra power piece. And like just putting that like thing in there a little bit and just having that hint of that, uh, I think really shapes the society that we're looking at and aligns it really well with our own. Yeah. Like it looks you know familiar. It's giving Catholic priest, okay? Oh, it's it is. giving it's giving um, you know, head uh it's giving like leader in the Boy Scouts, you know, it's giving it's giving, it's it's giving, giving head CE, coach. It's um, giving us uh, yeah, head coach. It's giving uh CEO and and producers in Hollywood mm. and uh and, and also like even though in this obviously in this world there there is nothing it is just very interesting of that choice too, especially because we then learn about other victors, specifically Annie, who is the who is his his the person that he is in love with, who is also from his district, who was also just as young and just as beautiful, like was his age and was not followed the same path as far as we're aware of. Uh, this interesting like thing of being like, nope, this is the one. It is the young boy. Uh and he learns how to play the game. He learns the game of secrets. But I do think that even though we don't see this happen in the books, that Finnick is proof of him not being the only one that they did this to. Oh, yeah. I, I can see, like, even though they don't go into Annie's well, backstory specifically, I can see this, you know, she was potentially one of these as well or others that we just well, don't hear I, about. Well, I actually don't think she was because Annie goes insane. She does. So I don't think she so she's not fit for it. 
she was not fit for it. I think, however, what that really shows is Finnick's ease and acceptance so easily accepted into it that this is not an uncommon secret. Yeah. This is not, this, this, this happens. Uh, And uh, I think, I think it's interesting that we hear about this from Finnick and never Hamish, but I think Mm -hmm. that's also because Hamish is whom we can assume would have had the same proposition and expectation, but due to Hamish's background, which we'll talk about in a second, made him also improper for it. Mm -hmm. So I think that Finnick is the proper golden boy. This is the ideal life of someone who is a victor and what they mm-hmm. live mm-hmm. and if you come out of it with enough of your mental faculties guess what you can be Finnick O'Dare as well and he and he just sits there and he 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 learned to play that role like he out of anybody like even Joanne who I'm, Joanna who we'll talk about in a second uh never really learned the game of politics never really Mm-mm. learned the game of of uh being able to fade into the social world of the Hunger Games in the Capitol. Mm-hmm. Finnick owns it. And yeah. there is a reason why there's like Finnick watch <laughs> still. Like people, people get excited. Like it talks about how people, how Katniss like watched people get excited every year as he came back and back and back. And people always wanted to know who he was dating. And, and like that, he, she just mentions it very briefly, but it's a very interesting part <laughs> yeah and Finnick plays into it too when he gives oh, his yeah. little victor speech and he does his little like love confession you know and there's all this and Katniss like notes all the swoons in the crowd of people imagining that it's about them that like oh he's he's remembering our time together oh my gosh you know and obviously he's not <laughs> he's but that's not, what they though. that's he's... what they like to imagine yes uh and so, I yeah oh, we'll, t- we'll talk I was gonna say I Finnick is such a hard character that I don't think could ever be portrayed correctly in a movie. But Santa's pretty darn good. He does a good job, but, I think. But I'm just like, man, this the, reading him as a character is so, like, you're just like, I get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I understand. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, I think they do a pretty good job with him in the movie, and, and we'll talk about that when we when we do the movies. So that yes. that's our that's our little our little moment of Finnick. Definitely um my favorite of the victors. I think his story is so compelling. And um and we'll talk we'll talk more about his role in the third book. But he's uh but yeah. He's definitely one of my favorites, but we gotta talk about my other favorite. Okay, let's go. Who is, who is the queen of Slytherin herself? <laughs> Fucking Joanna. I Oh, I spelled her name wrong actually now I'm just noticing it but it's okay no. it's it's fine uh fucking Joanna so Joanna was a victor in the 71st Hunger Games so mm-hmm. four years prior she's one of the she's one of the really fresh ones mm-hmm. um and she's from district seven so the one with uh like lumber and bark and all of that and uh <laughs> she basically tricked everybody in, and that's how she won, is that she really painted herself as the chance of her being meek and weak, and that she like faked not being able to hold an axe, that she like came, she like got sick days before she was supposed to go in, uh, that she she had really like fell into the hunger and fatigue and found a pe- found people to like take care of her almost. Uh, <laughs> And then, as Katniss says, uh, discovered very quickly that she had a wicked ability to murder people. Because uh, in the games, she hurt as soon as as soon as the jig was up, or as soon as she like was like enough people have died that I feel like I can win this. She went in, <laughs> and that's how she like fucking won her games. She's a literal axe murderer. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, her. Yeah. She's a literal axe murderer. Um, my my favorite thing about Joanna specifically is uh, is really the comparison between her and Finnick and how both of them use their sexuality to generate power. And I think about that from like the perspective of somebody that is in the working class that is marginalized and how often people in desperate situations, turn to things like sex work, turn to things like their sex appeal Mm -hmm. to simply 
survive. And well, I think that Finnick and Joanna both show different sides of that. Well, she also like she she was propositioned to get into prostitution as well. And Snow ended up murdering her entire family when she said, fuck that. So unlike unlike Finnick, who was like dived into the games, she fought back, murdered her entire family. And then she's like, my family's dead. All I've got is this. Mm-hmm. And he can't have it because mm-hmm. I will go, I will go like screaming and unwilling. And uh, people will know that I'm not happy about this, but I'm still going to use my sexuality, but I'm using it for me and not as a, not as a weapon, not as a tool, not in the good graces of the capital, but for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, I think Suzanne making the choice to make that person a woman to not have it. It could have been really easy to sly cunning girl who tricked everybody into taking care of her and then murdering them could have been the person who faded into the prostitution route and get garnered secrets. That, that is a trope as old as time. That could have been really easy to make that decision, but instead went, no, it's the young boy who does that. The young girl is the one that says, fuck you, murder my family. And now this is what I have. And it's mm-hmm. mine. I own mm-hmm. it. It's so good. And I, and I know, I know we're going to talk about the movies later, but I just want to give a shout out to like, I have, I have been in the elevator where Joanna gets naked. And by the way, that hotel is amazing. If you ever have a chance to go, it's in downtown Atlanta and it's one of the Dragon Con host okay. hotels. I was, was going to be like, who, where, when? It's in Atlanta. It's in Atlanta. Um, and okay. it's beautiful. And those elevators are beautiful, just by the way. Um, but, uh, but that whole scene where they, they meet Joanna and then when all each of the victors gets up during their conversation with uh, with Caesar and gives their little little bit about what they um how they feel about what's going on and Joanna's the only one that is openly angry that is openly telling the capital how evil they are for doing this and urging the crowd directly to do something about this yeah. like she asks the question like men made this can't men undo it and caesar doesn't know how the fuck to respond to that and it's it is truly the the i have nothing left to lose what's the worst he's going to do kill me he's Mm -hmm. already doing that yeah i they've killed my family i don't care about anybody else the worst that they can do is is kill me and they, they put me in the games to make this happen like i wouldn't be surprised if joe if this is obviously just speculation, but like, I think that this is an opportunity too for uh, Snow to kill conveniently kill off the people that he didn't he didn't appreciate and he didn't like. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm like, oh, I know, I feel like for a fact, Joanna's name was the only name written in in the yeah, it was just it was, was like, just her name five times or whatever. I don't know how yeah. many female victors the district had, but it's just her name five it's times. Like, in it's just her t- name because she she was the person who was out is the is outspoken the most against the capital who is asking the people in her districts the people in the capital to rebel against this uh and but like never garnered power or favorite like never garnered power or attention like Katniss did Mm -hmm. and so so even though her anger and outspokenness was righteous and there and I think there the entire time uh, because people didn't pay it since she was a fad favorite almost like yeah. people like put her out of her mind and, and she's kind of off putting like people yeah. probably don't want to hear from her because she's so angry all the time yes and we all know that one friend <laughs> <laughs> who, who posts who posts angrily on facebook uh <laughs> that uh, you're like you're right your delivery on this is not going to garner you any friends <laughs> we're like absolutely optics, right optics. <laughs> hey and you need some you need someone like that that person would be like the person who is like picketing every day in the writer strikes that are happening yeah 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 Yeah, like there's a lot of value there but (laughs) but but it's not not the same but not the face yeah um and i think that that's actually like a lot of tension between joanna and katniss for that reason yes um that joanna is so outspoken and so angry and katniss has been painted this pure, young, naive, foolhardily girl who would just do anything to protect the people she loves, whether that be volunteering for her sister 
or doing something like committing suicide for the boy that she loves. And Joanna is just like, that's so fucking stupid. Well, also, I think Joanna feels that it's fake because Joanna was fake when she came into the games. And so she's like, oh, Katniss trying to do my thing. She's trying to steal my thing. How freaking annoying. And so she can't, she can't like understand until she meets Katniss and really gets to know her. She can't understand what parts of Katniss are real and what parts aren't. Well, and even in the book, it says like that the whole elevator thing is for that reason. Mm -hmm. Is like trying to get, trying to see what the genuine reaction of, of this interaction is going to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, She's testing her. She's testing her. And uh, to see like, okay, when there's no cameras around, when there's nothing, when I am here doing this, doing my thing, how are you going to react? Are you going to react like the good little capital girl that everyone says that you are? Or are you going to act like a viper like I think you are? Mm -hmm. Um, So that she can then determine from there. And Katniss is either, neither of those things. No, Katniss is just herself. (laughs) Katniss diverts expectations once again. And I think that like, Joanna's like, fuck this yeah. is the person I'm going to have to throw my buddy behind and I hate it. <laughs> yeah. She's not happy. She's not happy no. that she agrees Katniss is the one that should be saved. <laughs> no. uh, but she's just fucking, she's just fucking dope. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she's just she's straight up just a ma- axe murderer. Mm-hmm. She's the best. She's the best axe murderer. She's the best axe murderer. Uh, and, and it's just so nice sometimes too. Like I, I'm so obsessed with D&D that sometimes things like this are just transmitted to D&D. And I'm like, it's so nice seeing a, you know, the female barbarian being, oh, yeah, yeah. being the big fighter of the party. And that's what this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's the best for that. Uh, shall we talk about two others? Yes. Okay. So the next ones we're going to talk about together, we're going to talk about Wyrus and BD. So Landon, tell us a little bit about their district and where they're from and what they did to win. Uh, so Wyrus and BD were obviously in two different Hunger Games, uh, but they're from the same district. I believe they were from District 11. It's the BD. electricity district, whichever the, yeah, that one is. It, which, one of the two. I'll Google uh, it. Thank you. And um, BD did the same fucking thing that he, that he uh, suggests in the book, which is to... Uh, rap which is that he got electric cords and was able to electrocute like 11 of the surviving tributes all at once it was i think i think it was one of the shortest hunger games Mm -hmm. uh if i remember correctly because he was able to like just knock out kill all of them at once basically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and and wyrus uh did they're from district three they're They're district three. three thank you uh, the very similar was not and was not uh what's my call it obviously was not um careers uh but uh, but did very very similarly as like uh what did I, I can't remember she used she used something to disable something uh and and was able to win that way she kind of waited out and was able to outsmart her players mm-hmm. yeah uh, that's so how both he, of them were yes they're obviously very smart very very good. Uh, and then have been used since then, since maybe aging out of the of the younger sides. Uh, BD has been very involved with the, the technological advances of a lot of the technology used in the capital. So such as the, uh, the we learned that he like invented the force fields. And something that we'll learn in, in Mockingjay is that he he invented the security systems. Mm-hmm. Like he he is the coder for all of that. Uh, and Wyrus as well. Both of them really, really take a lot of pride in, in their smarts and and their achievements and and kind of have given towards the capital, even if they're resentful. Both of them are playing that scientist character where it's like for the good of for the good of progress and have just kind of been waiting for a better progress to come up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the District 3, the district that they're from, is the Technology District, so that's why they're all smarty pants, um, and it does border District 12 to the east, so it's like to the east of Appalachia, like um, Illinois, um, Minnesota, uh, Indiana area, so mm-hmm. that's that's where District 3 is, and it's technology, which is why, um, so basically, Beattie and, Beattie and Wyrus both learned to code, yeah, um, and that's what they do, and that's what they're they use in the people. Hunger Games. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're just they're just so interested in stem uh, <laughs> and but like the thing that is that unlike finnick 
and Joanna who are showing up to every single Zoom meeting for the rebellion. Uh, Wyrus and BD are chosen as allies because those are the people that Katniss feels comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, neither of them are bloodthirsty. Neither of them are ambitious in the sense of like willing to fuck other people over. They both won uh, their games for survival purposes. Mm-hmm. Their their number one concern was I need to survive this, which is very similar to Katniss's perspective on the Hunger Games, rather than like a Finnick or a Joanna who was like I need to win this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that Katniss found a lot of uh a lot of herself in them, but also like a lot of comfort in them and was able to like understand them on a human level and we're the only two other than mags who we don't really talk about much but other than mags uh who uh who she chose as allies <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She she's like yeah the old woman and then the the two like weak tech bros <laughs> yeah. um and it's kind of it's very interesting so i i agree that Katniss chooses them because she sees them as winning their Hunger Games out of survival and not bloodthirsty. But I think that also her feeling that way goes to assuage parts of her that she is uncomfortable with. Like, Wyrus and Beatty have um, critical thinking skills like no other of the victors. They are incredibly intelligent and think through their problems in these very, like, methodical troubleshooting tech ways. And so Katniss sees them and sees that in them and thinks like, oh, they are someone I can relate to because that's how she wishes she was like she I think in a lot of ways she wish she values survival, but she wishes she won her games through just that value of survival. But she is actually bloodthirsty as well. She learned to kill from hunting and she doesn't really hate killing the other tributes. She doesn't hate it. I I disagree with you. I don't think Katniss is bloodthirsty at all. Uh, I think that she's thinking of the, ta- thinking she of the hurts- times that that Katniss has actually killed anybody. The only times Katniss killed someone was the person who directly killed Rue, and the person and Kata. Those no. are the only people. Yeah. She drops that tracker jacker nest, and she has qualms within herself okay. about how easy that was for her. Yes. Okay. But I, okay. I agree, but I don't think that that's, I think that that was a, how do I get down? Like to me, that's survival. She had to do that. And I think, and I think that that is that survival piece of like, she didn't ever want to win the hunger games. People were asking her to, but she didn't want to, which is why she kept Peta alive for so long. Well, I think that's how she likes to think of it, too, is all I'm saying. And so okay. Wyrus and Bita's friend, being friends with them, it gives her comfort yes. because they also feel that way, right? I'm not sure Katniss actually feels that way based on her inner monologue of the first book. I think that's how she wants to believe she feels. I think she is more, her monologue is more in line with Wyrus and Bita than it is a Joanne or a Finn. That's true. That's true. Which is, which is the two, which are the two camps and a Hamish. I think it's a Hamish virus and BD, which yes. are the two kind of camps that we see. Because that's of, the only like, ways you could win. You're either a virus BD or Hamish, or you're a Joanna and, and mm-hmm. Finnick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that, yeah, she feels more comfort in that. Because I think, like, she also looks at the careers and the people who do, while necessary, obviously, in her in her winning, the people that do have a bloodthirsty sort of palette for I like to just straight up kill things uh which is you know Joanna uh <laughs> well I think that Katniss that wants to feel that way I'm not sure she actually does I think she's more bloodthirsty than she wants to admit because she was able to learn it through hunting and killing animals in the forest We'll have to agree to disagree. I I would not say bloodthirsty as a as a word to describe Katniss Everdeen. Um, but yeah. So why? So having that connection, and then and then we can talk about because we don't have a slide for Mags, but Mags is also up in there of a old woman who can't talk. Uh, but it yeah, is she's that she's too old and broken at this point. She really can yeah. barely communicate. Only Finnick really knows how to talk to her, just because he's known her for so long, and she was his mentor. Uh. But I think that really shapes 
what rebellion is going to look like because of her choice to to align herself with virus wires and bd oh there's a cat hey there we go kitty cat hello baby <laughs> uh to align herself with virus and bd that mm-hmm. choice to do so um i think really sets the scene because also mags in there i think is what gets finnick yeah because i don't think finnick necessarily is on the rebellion zoom calls right away i think he becomes <laughs> part of it a when annie becomes in danger and b after after he's already like burned all the bridges uh and so i think that really shapes it of like okay this is this is the way that we have to take it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> we and can't go in this easy. all bloodthirsty and i think it's very easy to get finnick on board when katniss chooses mags because then all the rebellion has to do is say hey we'll go um we'll go save annie for you and then he's like i'm d- i'm on yes yeah. Let's yeah. do it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> he has no reason not to at that point. He's, he's very much, he's very much like, I, I, I imagine him as being the person who's like, oh, who is the winner? Like, I, mm-hmm. who do I see winning this thing? And that's where I'm going to put my money. Yeah. And I see that, I see that A, because he also knows that Snow is sick. We don't know this at this point, but he knows it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Snow is sick and he can see where the chips are going to fall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. virus and bd don't have a clue but they're nope. but they're like oh cool we need to keep katniss alive for reasons that are going to turn the tide of this sure let's do it <laughs> mm-hmm. and then i think from joanna's perspective she sides with them because her anger is so real she's she's she is hosting the zoom calls of yeah. the rebellion like <laughs> she's there she's like she's like yeah anything that is gonna say fuck you and if there is a chance in which I mean, obviously, the original plan was to have Katniss win, but if there is a chance in hell that we can escape, yeah, let's do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. For sure. Yeah. But there's one more victor that we would like to talk about that we've kind of danced around, and that is um, that's Hamish. So oh the Hi. last victor, the last potential victor of District 12, and it's quite it's quite a bit into the book. Before we even learn, oh my gosh, hi Sherlock. Before we even really learn how Hamish won his games. Um, and gosh, it parallels Katniss so much. My it gosh. It does. Uh, yes. And we, and we learn a lot of detail for him. Um, but basically, he, he has a, he has an alliance with another, with another person and he's he's kind of on the outskirts of things until and he was years ago he's the 50th so he was the first quarter fall which there were double sorry that's important there were double the amount of victors and people pulled so uh there were four from each district and Mm -hmm. that was the cool thing that happened for the 50th anniversary um and he was able to get some weapons that keep him off and he and Nicely, yeah uh we're able to form a team uh and eventually basically does not make it uh and he Mitch tries to like uh sorry i'm distracted by this cat who is just oh i can finish it so so basically what what Hamish does is he learns that there is a force field off of a cliff and that um, the force field makes you bounce back. And so he uses that knowledge to basically make it seem like that he's going to die off of a cliff. Um, he throws he throws a weapon or it's something like that. And the weapon bounces back and it, it gets the other person smack in the face. And uh, basically he, he uses the tools around him to yes. to do the killings that he does in his Hunger Games, which are few, just like Katniss. Um and ultimately, his desire through watching the tapes of the Hunger Games that we can find is just to not engage. Like he goes to the edge of the of the field that they're in with the logic of like, it has to end somewhere. I want to see what the edge of the arena looks like and uh, and just stay there until this is all yeah. over as much as I can. Well, and then, yeah, so he ends up he ends up almost using the capital's technology to win which is what i believe angers the capital yes because that's why they don't is, like him there is no reason 
why after he wins two weeks later his entire family and his girlfriend ends up dead like it's unlike Joanna, who he he never refused or was never told to go into prostit- prostitution. He he, as far as we're aware, uh, he he literally just they end up dying, and he knows it's the capital, and it's it they and the, it is this. There's like this undercurrent sense of Snow felt that Hamish made him look like a fool. Yep. For using for using what the capital what the capital's technology was in order to gain victory. Yep. I mean, they and, changed how the force fields work after him. And that's what, then that's what ends up like being also why, uh, Hamish is like, so like, there is this moment in the, in the last of the first book where Hamish is like, you've, you've made them feel a fool. You don't understand. You've, you've set off a chain reaction that you can't control. And it's because of this situation mm-hmm where he he used this force field he used it as a weapon uh and he made them feel a fool and that cost him everything uh and all, he's trying to get Katniss to see it and he does and Katniss does not because I think there's so much attention on Katniss mm-hmm. Snow can't react in the same way that he did they, they did love they love her too much they love her too they, much they love her too much if Prin died mysteriously died uh people would riot that would that would not help the riots like killing Katniss's family would not help it would not serve the lesson people would be angry she would be angry Mm -hmm. threatening to kill them however had more power whereas with Hamish it was like a revenge thing this is more strategic to try to control the crowds with snow which is why there's a different reaction but that's also why we have Hamish's like you don't know what you've started. This is mm-hmm. this is the game that you're going to be playing for the rest of your life. You don't know. You don't understand. Yep, because he played it. He literally played it. And he didn't. And he like that's the other thing too is that he didn't mean to. Mm-mm. Like that is one of the things where he's like, it was an unspoken rule that was never spoken, but it was like a you embarrassed me. Yeah. You didn't kill it. She ended up killing herself, basically. Hmm. Pretty much. So from Haymitch, we would like to take a moment to talk just a little bit about uh, District 12 itself. We've talked about some of the districts before, but I just wanted to do like a little brief aside about District 12 in this book in particular. And I just want to remind everyone that District 12 is in the same area as Appalachia today. And Appalachia is an incredibly poor part of our country. It is not um, an accident that what we see whenever the capital comes into District 12 and like redoes the peacekeepers and all of that, that they basically live in shanty towns and like trailers and things of that nature. Not that we have like shanty towns exactly in Appalachia today, but there is that amount of poverty and that we are in that region of the country is moving in that direction. So it's no mistake that all of this happens in District 12. And it's no mistake that the District 12 uh, tributes are put at a disadvantage when they live in the district that doesn't start their like profession until age 18, unlike some of the other districts. Like All of that is no mistake. You're supposed to be reminded of how poor and destitute Appalachia is today in our country. So just yeah, brief aside I, on District 12. I also think that there's this interesting like moments of the incoming of the guards and very, very kind of rep- uh, like reminiscent of some like police force mm-hmm. coming in. Um, very, very reminiscent of uh, the poverty difference between what is Appalachia today and the one percent and we see that with the difference between Katniss and the people who are like of the district who are like oh here's this potion that will make you throw up so that you can enjoy more food Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh where you know obviously they're starving back home and they're Suzanne Collins does so well on connecting this world that is not our world 
with our world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is what I think makes the Hunger Games so successful is that there is there is the space thing that you're like, you can't assume that anything is the same. But hey, let me tell you what is the same. Yeah. And it's very clear. So that you know that you know enough and you never like you never feel uninformed with the world because mm-hmm. you know it. So I'd like to go from there into talking about the capital itself. Um, so before we kind of get into what's on the slide here, I just want to play, I just want to play this, this TikTok. So about every, I don't know, two or three years, someone pops out of the woodwork in the Hunger Games and gets in the Hunger Games fandom and goes, ah, oh, the Hunger Games is, is a uh, conservative actually. So this was the latest take. Um, this happened in March. This person made a TikTok and it started making the rounds. I saw it because someone had retweeted this, um, Tara Mookie, uh, who's, a, who's a YouTuber, uh, sharing this particular TikTok. So we're going to play this partic- particular TikTok so everyone can hear it. Landon, I'll let you know when it's done because I know you won't be able to hear the audio. Um, and then I want to talk about this, what, what the person in this TikTok is saying. So here we go. Let's watch it. Okay. So just to reiterate what that man just said. At the end, he goes, the Hunger Games is January 6th. I, <sighs> media literacy is dead. Um, we will never recover. Uh, this is, this oh, is terrible. The, the, the Hunger Games is January 6th? Yes. You mean the Hunger Games, which was produced 10, 10 years ago? I'm going to just give it a roundabout number. That's probably not true. It's probably longer. It was January 6th of 2021? Well... So what he's trying to say is that this is like a conservative revolution because Katniss is this redneck girl who comes in and destroys the affluent, effeminate capital. Okay, you know what? The capital is not gay, y'all. To it's say, not. To say that you, oh, it's 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 a little gay, but it's like it's gay in the way that uh, privilege allows you to be above uh-huh. the rules of society. Uh-huh. It's not. It's not. A direct thing of being like, hey, everyone's queer here. Y'all, the reason the reason that the capital is flamboyant and effeminate is because they are the soft ruling class. It's supposed to remind you of Rome. It's supposed to remind you of the French aristocracy. Okay, that's why it's like that. It's not supposed to remind you of going to the drag show. Okay, it's not... Uh, the reason that the, that the capital is effeminate oh. and fashion forward and media obsessed is not the same reason that gay people do those behaviors. The root cause is so vastly different. Like, I can't, I just don't. <sighs> media literacy is dead. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, okay. Go ahead, Jesus. Landon. You, you, you I give was, your thought and then I'll collect what I'm trying to say here. I was just going to say, Jesus. <laughs> uh, so, yes. The more money you have, the more money you can spend on things like fashion and food and makeup and all of these things that show physical signs of being rich which is something that exists in our culture today has existed in human culture for the entirety of human culture mm-hmm. uh it's why it's why people who uh, are rich live in castles uh <laughs> bought fancy clothing uh had y- colorful jewels and gems and necklaces and things that are unnecessary these are the products of power but here's the deal how do you show a futuristic society of what that, uh, I can't think of the word, materialistic uh, greed looks like in a society that is similar to ours, but not ours. And that's all the capital is, is it's showing future of fashion. So much of the capital is like fashion brands literally take inspiration off of the you know 2000s and 2010s to then be like okay and what if we did it more cheetah mm-hmm. print was a big one and guess what they make in the the third book 
is a person who has had surgery to look more like a cheetah. Like, <laughs> like that's literally the the connections of that is is like how do we make this us but more with more technology and more money to to show that materialistic greed because that's the only way we can show it it's not mm-hmm. gay mm-hmm. and this There's is the nothing thing that, this is the thing <laughs> that i think conservative commentators on the internet don't understand they don't understand how rich people operate okay so y'all i'm about to give you the tea on how rich people operate there is nouveau rich and there is old rich okay nouveau rich is what you see in all of the bystanders in the capital that's what that's effie trinket that's the the stylist that's all of that okay that's how they are they want to show off their wealth they want to flaunt their wealth they want you to know how wealthy they are okay old money doesn't act like that why if this is like the the gaze oh we, we went forward go back no i know I'm it's okay dying. ah why is it not letting me go back there we there go. We, oh, computer. There we go. Okay, we're on the right one now. Okay, so for the for the old rich or the old money people, they do not do this. Okay, what a snowware that's so flamboyant. Nothing. You know why? Because he's old money. Okay, because he's old money. Okay. Now, if you okay, so now we have these two things. So now Sita. we have like also by the way. Yeah, Cinna doesn't. Senna doesn't doesn't flash, okay? Because he's old money and he understands how the capital actually works and he doesn't agree with that. Okay? He's that's that's why Senna's the way he is. Okay. Does Plu, does Plutarch uh, you know, flamboyant it up? No. No, he doesn't. Neither does the other games and maker it, from the first book. And just because these are characters that we have names and actual people to and know that they're as far as we assume are straight, doesn't mean that everybody else that we see is gay. <laughs> No, it doesn't. And here's the other thing. So this is why these characters are doing this. If you think about like why in real life a gay person or a queer person is particularly flamboyant is because they are trying to be counterculture. The flamboyance is not to fit in and to get noticed by the uh, old rich people because that's why the that's why the new rich people are doing it. They want to they want to signal, hey, we're one of you, we're one of you, and the old rich people are like, mm, sure. Um, but that's what they're doing. But when queer people do it, they're signaling that I am counterculture. I am not like you. It's not the same. The root cause is not the same because no one in the capital is out here dressing in drag to try to like um, be their true inner self while not caring that they upset anyone. That never they're happens. Just, they're dressing in drag because uh, in the early 2000s and 2010s, drag was a controversial topic of discussion and fashion. Yeah, it that's was why they're in drag fashion trend. is because they were like, hey, this is a fashion trend that's happening. How do we go above it? Yeah. How do we go more? That was a chosen choice by the author and the movie directors uh, based off of familiar fashion to make us understand the point of the Capitol. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. So the Capitol is not some queer mecca <laughs> oppressing which, the rurals it's not that which, it's just I'm rome so sorry i just don't understand how you could they can be literally dragged into a coliseum by chariot with an entire amphitheater watching them overrun by a tyranny tyrannic dictator with like symbols of olive branches and peace and memorabilia and just giving all the Rome signs and people are like actually <laughs> it's not Rome all all I can say is that people see what they want to see I know people see what they want to see and we don't teach media literacy to our children anymore and so then people have these god awful takes like this um and and it's just anyway the capital's Rome Y'all, and in three years, when someone else makes a take like this that that takes off on whatever the popular social media is three years from now, the capital's <laughs> Rome. Okay, it, that's why it's it, how it is. That's why it looks how it is. That's why it's described how it is. They literally put children to fight to the death in an arena. 
that happened. That actually yeah. happened in history. <laughs> yeah. And 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 the truth is, Katniss doesn't lead the rebellion. She doesn't lead the yeah. rebellion. She's a symbol that the rebellion uses to further their own ends. She anyway, we'll talk rebellion. about that more in the third book. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, okay. Anyway. So we, we are here to revive media literacy. Now you all know. <laughs> you can't. You can't take one thing out of context and be like, this is the whole context. It's anyway. not. Yeah. No. Yeah. Anyways, <sighs> let's talk about the rebellion itself. Viva la revolution. Viva yes. la rebellion. The, re- the rebellion. So the point of this, the way that the rebellion is portrayed in this book is the rebellion happens everywhere. It is all around. Mm-hmm. It is ever present, um, ever present, and it never goes away. But it's also dis disconnected like i think that's the important part too of this is not a full-out rebellion like we will see in the in the next book we are seeing district by district rebellion in its own way because there isn't a lot of travel or communication between districts the capital has done an amazing job stone has done an amazing job of like separation of all of these districts. Uh, the only way that Katniss knows what is going on with District 8 is that she hears about it on the train home and she meets people who survived it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's never on in District 12. It's not on the news. It's not on any of the information that she's consuming. It's literally because she goes to all these districts and because that she is happy, happily runs into some people who are running away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, they're disconnected. So all of these different rebellions are happening in different places, but they're all disconnected. Even the small rebellion that happens in the Capitol where the crowd shouts to cancel the games, it's disconnected from the rebellions that are happening in the districts. And that is why at the end of this particular book, even though several of the victors end up surviving and are saved, and so not all the tributes die as was planned, um, not everyone gets out. Because the capital still is ultimately in control at the end of this book because the rebellion is not yet centralized. It is decentralized. And the way that power exists for the underclass is solidarity, which they don't have yet. Which also feels incredibly familiar. And if it feels incredibly familiar, it's because that's what step of the revolution and rebellion we are currently on. Yes. Is the is the 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 disfranchised, disconnected things of, of like and the rebellion against capitalism, not necessarily a country or government, more of a concept. And it's things like, oh, this is being it's it's these groups of people who are really passionate about this sort of rebellion, whether that be LGBTQ rights, this sort of rebellion about uh race, this sort of re- rebellion about this. And what the work is for the next steps is bringing it all together. And so if it feels really familiar, it's because it is really familiar. Right. (laughs) And what's great about Catching Fire is that while we're having all of these little pocket rebellions, one of the really powerful things that happens is that the rebellion happens in the capital too. And those people Mm -hmm. realize, hey, actually, I'm being harmed by the system too. Now, they don't see it in a more direct way, but they see, hey, all of my favorite celebrities are about to go die. This actually does hurt me too. These Hunger Games are bad, actually. They don't help my life. They hurt it. They hurt it. And, uh, and, And I think that, like, it's very interesting how some of these rebellions take place and how they differ from one another Mm -hmm. so we have district 11 which is up here uh in the corner that it's the first district that uh katniss goes to and uh they are obviously so hurt by the loss of rue and touched by katniss's kindness towards rue that 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 love and adoration for katniss is what kind of sparks this rebellion because what the rebellion really is is just whistling saying the sign of respect which is the three fingers and that in itself is enough to result in uh that like is the rebellion it they don't start a full fight uh in that scenario only one person as far as we're aware dies which is the old man who started it uh everything else everybody else is just kind of kept 
back to normal every day sort of stuff. Yeah, That's the peacekeepers so come in and just like yeah. make you like it truly, truly reminds me of when the protests were happening here and yeah. people were marching in the street. And I saw this literally in downtown Charleston. I watched people marching along, not doing anything bad and police officers picking fights with them. I watched it happen mm -hmm. on the news on various live feeds, like literally that is all that it took. And by the way, Charleston, South Carolina, I'm in District 11. So that's what happened. Yeah. And and even and even in some cases, this particular book example is even less than like that. They're not marching. They're forced to come to this, this meeting. They're forced to be here. No, it is a requirement of being a part of District 11 that you are here, just like it is a requirement to attend the reapings. Uh, you have to be here. And all they do is show a, a moment of solidarity, which is certainly not illegal, which is not protesting. It's not anything. They show solidarity for something and are punished for that. So, yes, very, very in line to to uh, the marches, but even more peaceful, even even less antagonistic or anti anything, more of just a way of being like, hey, we see you. Thank you for what you did. And that results in the death of something. That is considered a rebellion in this, as much as District's Eight Rebellion, which is like literally, we're going to kill the peacekeepers, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> and knock shit down and right? go fucking buck wild, yeah, like uh, get it, a riot, like a riot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's very similar to what it was. It was like, oh, there's a peaceful protest happening here, and in this state, there's a riot happening. Uh, both of and both of those are part of the rebellion. Like that, this, that is how District 8 chose to re rebel. Why I think District 8 chose to rebel that way is because they're a little closer to the food source. They're a little less, uh, they're a little less uh, in popular. They're, they're, they're less poor than District 11 and District 12 is. Uh, so they have the privilege of being able to rebel in a much more serious way of mm -hmm. like burning down stuff. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> even, and, even though, District 11 is agriculture. They are punished severely for taking food. So they're, even though oh, they're yes. around, surrounded by food, they're starving the same way 12 is. Yes. They, yes. And then it is very much on control. Whereas District 8 was a little bit more of a favorite and had, and had some liberties, but not many. Yeah. Uh, and, and was able and rebelled in a completely different way. And, but again, was shut down. Both District 11 was shut down and District 8 was shut down so that it didn't leave beyond the borders of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and I think that that's, that just goes to show the temperature that is existing within this world of like, okay, rebellions, big and small, in, in no matter what the purpose of that rebellion is, is also being treated with the same result. Mm -hmm. And that is enhancing the rebellion happening because this is the this is the point like whether you are somebody that lives in the proverbial capital or you are somebody that lives in like district 11 or district 12 it doesn't matter all working class has the same interests it doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether you live you're not part of the owning class you're working yep. class and we should be working together well it also doesn't matter with District 12, which showed zero signs of rebellion. Mm -hmm. There were nothing changed when Katniss came back. There was no, there was celebration for it when Katniss and Peter came back. But there wasn't any more talk of revolution or rebellion happening in District 12. But they brought in more cops anyway. They brought in more peacekeepers anyway. And that did end up affecting the affecting the working class and ended up punishing them more because people got whipped. People, you know, began to be killed. Uh, and yeah, the hob, in, the hob gets destroyed. The hob gets destroyed. In this, in this book, we don't understand what is happening. Uh, the movie does a great job of connecting it all together. But if you are politically informed on the life and breadth of how rebellions start and continue, this is a great example of like being in it and how disjointed it feels within this step. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then we have different characters we see on different levels of the rebellion. So one of them, 
being Cinna, who I do feel we have to talk about, even though he is not on the slide, of uh, straight up going like, hey, I'm ingrained. I'm old money in this world. My family has been in the capital for as long as we can remember. I realize that this is wrong. I do not like this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to literally burn it to the ground. Uh, what I can burn to the ground. And I'm going to make a symbol that they cannot block. That everyone can see that for a moment connect everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he pays he for it. Die. He yeah. dies. Yeah. He ends up being killed. Yeah. And it's um, it's like it's something that I'm sure that if we had this had some more from other characters perspective than Katniss, like people would be like shocked and dismayed and be like, I can't believe you got Cinna. So Mm -hmm. it is very, very sad. Yeah. And or it'd be like this thing of like, oh, just it, it, it sparks a moment of hope. And then I I don't think, yeah, I don't think characters ever really learn about his death. He just kind of disappears. Mm -hmm. And that's what often happens. It's it's not like he was publicly executed. He was murdered and it just meant that his, he was no longer going to be relevant. Yeah. Um, And and then the other form of of inner rebellion, like within the movement that we see is Plutarch. Mm -hmm. uh, Who is in the very, very high levels. And, and he's, he becomes the next games maker. I mean, you know. Yeah. And and in the movie, like we see and again, and knowing not wanting to talk about, but he's controlling perception. He's mm-hmm. controlling like how the next games are going to be run, the decision to quarter quell. He's he's running all of this. And we see that as a bad thing because all of these choices are bad. And then in the end it turns out that it's like, oh, he was he was the one communicating all along. He was, you know, he tipped off Katniss to sit there and be like, hey, it's a clock. Uh, even flashed her the Mockingjay, which mm-hmm. like she doesn't even realize is like a, hey, I'm working for you sort of sim- symbol because she's not even connected to any of these yeah. rebellions. Yeah, well, because she doesn't, she isn't connected back to the crackers, <laughs> even though she could have. And we she do could've. as yeah. readers, but she doesn't. Well, and for her, and in that moment, it's like so, it's. Month, it's months later mm-hmm. she gets an ick vibe from Plutarch he is he is capital definition of capital like person so of yeah. course he's not connected we as readers sit there and go oh the foundation was all along he tried to tell her that he was on her side his mm-hmm. her side she just didn't get it yeah yeah <sighs> man I just love this book I just love this book so much it's so good <laughs> it's so good uh, <laughs> and it just yeah it it happens it happens in the capital it happens everywhere and i think that that's something that's just really realistic mm-hmm. and again connects us to like the realism and also knowing that this is dedic- this is like prevalent towards teenagers and where what the audience is supposed to be young adults and this is what's being written just shows that susan collins is like deserves to be in the if there was a YA canon, absolutely deserves to be in it. Yeah, this because, is like must reading, must reading for yes. YA. Absolutely. And, and why I think it also, like, I for those of you who don't know, next year, if uh, I might be reading Hunger Games with my kids. And so it's like, it's going to be interesting of the ways that they're going to connect to the world. And, I'm so, I'm so curious uh, to hear what they think about it for your age group. Because I think that, I think that this is a lot of, a lot of the stuff that they've, they've grown up with. Yeah. Like a lot of the same sort of sort of uh, themes that they're seeing in their everyday life is is definitely pre- pre- prevalent throughout their lives and in this book. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that brings us to the final question of our show, which is, does it resonate? So um, for me, this this is obvious. Like, yes. OK, like literally like we're living in the Hunker Games now in so many ways, like obviously not in this like, um, you know, po- post climate disaster sort of uh, sort of way that happens in the Hunger Games. It's sort of a fantastic way. But uh, in a very real way, every story beat of the Hunger Games is still happening all around us all the time. Mm-hmm. So, yes, like unequivocally, unequivocally. What about for you, Landon? Yeah, as I was saying, the, if it feels familiar, it's because it is. Mm-hmm. Like, from every step of this, we are in this world. 
Uh, and it is a shadow reflection of where we're at. And uh, there should be college courses on the connections of this and the next steps of of sociology based off of the Hunger Games, in my opinion, because it's like, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a road. This is a road. That's well, I don't know. I don't I don't know if college is appropriate for it, but we should be teaching this book should be one of like the canon required like high school readings like this should be on oh, a lot of people's high school. Reading you know list. what? I think that this book way more prevalent to most Americans than Lord of the Fly. Lord, yeah. Lord of the Fly. Fly yes. Lord yes, of the Flies. It. Yeah. There we go. Lord yeah. of the Flies. Uh, 100%. I think mm-hmm. that this should 100% be the new high school canon uh, because it's there are so many things that are, are relevant to this and that kids can connect to in way better ways than yeah, Lord of the Flies. <laughs> it's true. It's or true. Catcher in the Rye. Get Catcher out of the, of the Rye out of the fucking <laughs> American canon. It doesn't need to be in there anymore. There's so much better YA that shows the loss of inno- innocence and coming of age. <laughs> I mean, Catcher in the Rye is not bad, but I have to admit, I, 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 read, I, I, I was forced to read it twice. And any any book that you end up having to read multiple times, you're not going to have like the best experience of it it's, when you're forced. I, it's, I, this is my teaching platform right now. It's I don't know a single child that would be like, oh, yeah, that one feels relevant to my life. And I don't know if you know this, the kids only think about things in terms of their life. At least with like catching fire and fucking Hunger Games, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen protests before. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I've been in situations where I feel like I've had to like fight for my life. (laughs) (laughs) I've been oppressed by things. With Catching the Rye, it's just like, did you ever have to, did you ever run away from home for three days? (laughs) Well, he's also quite abused in that book. But I think maybe it's hard for kids to pick up on that. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so yeah, Hunger Games definitely resonates in 2023. Like no fucking question. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm excited to see where it goes with Mockingjay. Yeah. We'll do that in a couple months. So where can you find us? You can find us right here, right here on Twitch. Drop a follow if you like today's stream. Next week, we are going to be doing um, Stardew Valley. So we're going to be doing our Stardew Valley Community Day next week. So come join us for some shenanigans. Uh, Kitty and Kendra is who is normally there for for Stardew Valley. So that's probably who's going to be there. Um, Also, tomorrow, I am doing the finale of Majora's Mask. We're going to be at the very end of that game tomorrow. And we're going to be starting a new game after that week. So you should definitely come back and hang out for that. Um, my main social medias are, our Twitch, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and Discord. So let me do, let's do an exclamation socials. So you can, you can join me in all of those places. So that's a little bit about where to find me. Landon, where can everyone find you? You can find me on land in Maine in most, uh, on most social medias. Uh, biggest ones being Instagram, obviously TikTok. I'm on Twitter sometimes, mostly to just fangirl over, uh, Karen and then sometimes I make a random appearance in the discord but it's every once in a blue moon and only on a Tuesday uh, <laughs> but uh, and I'll be back here in uh, two weeks to discuss uh, our phantom episode for the Hunger Games yes so for our next for our kind of follow-up Hunger Games episode we are going to talk about um, dystopian YA, the dystopian YA boom that happened after the Hunger Games. Um, we're not going to analyze any one uh, series specifically, but we're going to talk about that in general and share some of our thoughts on several different examples of uh, of those books that came within like the like kind of five years after the the peak have, of Hunger Games popularity. I have a very funny story for that. So uh, when Karen uh, Karen and I had a call uh, to like plan this and we talked about what was going to be next, I, I was in the car with my friend Kelsey and did not like our takes on one of the books that we talked about. Uh, was the the next thirty minutes after I hung up with our call, Karen was her defending uh, a certain series that we're both going to shit talk. Uh, during the fan during the fan uh the the fandom episode oh my gosh you wanna you wanna hear about what apparently is a spicy take on certain ya dystopian novels uh come watch it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah so that's week after next right here same um karen and landon time same karen and landon place all right you guys so let's go ahead then next and uh and say goodbye 
to land in for today. We are going to be playing some more of our Sims 2 Legacy after this. I'm going to take a short break. So, um, so after that, we will do that. And for everybody watching the VOD on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Woo woo!